In these two presentations of 20 minutes or so, I want to cover the material we would have gone over in class on the management of the area beyond national jurisdiction and deep seabed mining. So the importance of this diagram is that it illustrates that a substantial area of the world's seafloor is not governed by the EEZ or continental shelf regimes. It is beyond national jurisdiction. And the question then is how that area and exploitation of non-living resources in the area is to be managed. And I'd like to start by contrasting two particular historical moments. First, in 1974, a corporation in the United States, Deep Sea Ventures, sent a letter to the US Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, asking the United States to uh, assert Deep Sea Ventures' claims to have uh, occupied certain lands in the clarion Clipperton zone on the seafloor and that it was staking a claim to conduct mining exploration there and expected the United States to defend its rights, to which the US State Department replied that it was not in the business of recognising private entities claiming, uh, in effect, jurisdiction and control over the seabed. Flash forward to 2012, and the Nautilus Minerals Group announces that it is attempting um, seabed mining within Papua New Guinea's exclusive economic zone, testing its technology, and through a different mining corporation, uh, has been sponsored by Papua New Guinea to explore the clarion Clipperton zone under the International Seabed Authority's jurisdiction. Now, the interesting thing here is that we have a situation where the rush towards seabed mining, well, I say rush, but it's been uh, a technology that's been expected to work for basically 50 or 60 years and still uh, has yet to see any um, commercial return. But nonetheless, the impetus here has generally been from corporations, which is something we'll come back to. And uh, in the next slide, we'll take a look at the clarion Clipperton zone, but essentially we're dealing with an enormous uh, mountainous seafloor oceanic ridge that's rich in resources. So what can one mine on that kind of um, oceanic ridge or near hydrothermal, hydrothermal vents? The essential resource is polymetallic nodules, an ID we'll come back to, and also uh, polymetallic sulphides. And recently, uh, it's been discovered that at depths of 400 to 5,000 metres, one can find ferromanganese crusts, which are rich in cobalt. So the idea is that these polymetallic nodules found on the seafloor, as one would expect, are made up of multiple potentially valuable uh, metals, um, including cobalt, copper, and so forth. But in designing a system to govern the exploitation of the seafloor, an interesting question to ask is, was this meant to be a commercially driven system? Was it envisaged as one driven by private corporations? Uh, so just briefly, it's worth thinking about what the technology involved might look like. Essentially, remotely piloted machines will need to churn up the seafloor and we see the scale of these sort of open cut mining digging machines on the right and uh, transform that churned up you know, rock and mud and resource into a liquid slurry that would then be pumped up to a support vessel and this could operate at depths potentially of 1600 meters so this is essentially strip mining and one could imagine that great quantities of uh, seabed material would be thrown into the water column creating undersea dust clouds. This is not an activity that can be conducted in a particularly environmentally sensitive way. 
the extent that environmental protection is envisaged, it is simply that one would mine in some areas and then, as it were, leave refuge areas for uh, undersea life to hopefully retreat to. And this is the so-called clarion Clipperton fracture zone, and this map demonstrates areas that have been uh, licensed for um, exploration by um, states and commercial entities, and also areas that have been reserved for the use of the International Seabed uh, Authority, and we'll come back to that idea of reserved areas. All right, so polymetallic nodules on the seafloor were first discovered in uh, 1872 um, in a scientific expedition conducted by the HMS Challenger but no one attempted to estimate the quantity of resources that might be contained in such nodules until uh, Miro wrote a book uh, in 1965 preceded by a 1957 report which estimated that there would be truly extraordinary quantities of resources available on the seafloor. This led uh, Ambassador Pardo of Malta in 1967 to make a speech in the UN General Assembly in which he said, the seabed and the ocean floor are a common heritage of mankind and should be used and exploited for peaceful purposes and for the exclusive benefit of mankind as a whole. That is, there was a concern that in a period of Cold War tensions between nuclear armed superpowers, there could uh, be a race to occupy and exploit the seabed, uh, and also in a context of many newly independent states, uh, this could be, there was a risk that any system of seabed exploitation dependent on advanced technology would favour highly industrialised states at the expense of uh, less industrialised states. So in 1967, a seabed committee is established within the UN General Assembly. The General Assembly also passes two resolutions, the 1969 Moratorium Resolution and a 1970 Declaration of Principles. The key provision of the 1969 Moratorium Resolution stated that states and persons, physical or juridical, are bound to refrain from all activities of exploitation of the resources of the area of the seabed and ocean floor and the subsoil thereof before the beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. So this resolution purported to require all states and all people and corporations require that they not engage in any mining activity in the deep seabed. Now the General Assembly, as a strict legal matter, lacks authority to pass binding uh, law, um, but can make recommendatory uh, statements such as this. And similarly, in 1970, it made a declaration of principles, the seabed and ocean floor and the subsoil thereof beyond the limits of national jurisdiction, hereinafter referred to as the area, as well as the resources area are the common heritage of mankind. So the point here is that while uh, the group of 77 less developed states claimed that these resolutions were binding in law, that is a difficult proposition to maintain as a matter of the law of the UN Charter. Nonetheless, they laid down principles uh, and ideas that were later taken up in the third UN conference on the law of the sea that of course resulted in the law of the sea convention. Now why was all this taken so seriously, the idea that there are resources lying around on the seafloor? Well we have the following quote from Ambassador Pardo's speech. The known resources of the seabed and the ocean floor are far greater than the resources known to exist on dry land. The seabed and the ocean floor are also of vital and increasing in strategic importance. Present and clearly foreseeable technology also permits their effective exploitation for military or economic purposes. Some countries may therefore be tempted to use their technical competence to achieve near unbreakable world dominance through predominant control over the seabed and the ocean floor. 
This, even more than the search for wealth, will impel countries with the requisite technical competence competitively to extend their jurisdiction over selected areas of the ocean floor. The process has already started and will lead to a competitive scramble for sovereign rights over the land underlying the world's seas and oceans, surpassing in magnitude and its implications last century's colonial scramble for territory in Asia and Africa. The consequences will be very grave. At the very least, a dramatic ex escalation of the arms race and sharply increasing world tensions caused also by the intolerable injustice that would reserve the plurality of the world's resources for the exclusive benefit of less than a handful of nations. The strong would get stronger, the rich richer, and among the rich themselves there would arise an increasing and insuperable difference between two or three and the remainder. So it was genuinely believed that there was an internationally game-changing level of resources on the seafloor, but also that weapons emplacements on the deep sea floor could change the course of the Cold War. Another thing to consider is that uh, at various points in history, and this illustrative example of uh, cobalt prices between 1959 and 1998 um, shows one critical resource, there have been at certain points dramatic spikes in the prices of key strategic minerals and metals for highly industrialized societies. And around the time of those spikes, and we can see that one of them occurred during much of the Law of the Sea Convention negotiations, it seems much more feasible that a lot of money might be spent on deep sea mining technology if the returns could be very high. When those prices fall again, seabed mining looks perhaps less economically attractive. The other thing we need to consider in understanding how the seabed mining regime as we presently have it came about is uh, it occurs in the context of developments in the history of international law I've spoken about before, uh, principally the new international economic order. So this was a set of ideas advanced by newly industrialized states premised on the idea that uh, newly independent states, sorry, premised on the idea that now that they were the majority of states in the world, the international legal order should be able to be reshaped to create a more just economic system. So one of the key instruments of the new international economic order was the 1974 Programme of Action and Allied Declaration. And these included amongst their goals the idea that developing states should have full and effective participation in international organisations and lawmaking processes. So this would be one state, one vote lawmaking without special voting rights for great powers or highly industrialised powers, um, as we see, for example, uh, in the status given to the permanent five members of the UN Security Council developing a system under which there would be some just and equitable relationship between the price of primary commodities exported by developing countries and the price of their imports from developed countries. So the idea of production and price controls was intrinsic to the new international economic order. Uh, and indeed we see this in the next point, that there should be price controls for primary commodities exported by developing countries to prevent unnecessary competition among exporters of primary products and uh, that there should be transfer of technology in the sense of giving access on improved terms to modern technology to developing states. So not necessarily a wholesale system of expropriation and transfer, but some kind of preferential access or licensing system, and that there should be greater regulation and control over the activities of transnational corporations. So. This leads us to the question, though, why do you need new principles to govern exploitation of the deep seabed? Well, if you relied on existing law, there were basically three possibilities. Um, as we've seen, Article 1 of the Geneva Convention on the Continental Shelf was governed by a criterion of exploitability. That is, you could assert jurisdiction as far as technology would permit. Uh, now, that could ultimately lead to all of the deep seabed being enclosed by a handful of major powers so long as they had the technology to keep going further and further offshore. Uh, the other possibility would be uh, the principle of freedom in um, the High Seas Convention. 
So resources on the seabed floor would belong to whoever collected them first, uh, which could lead to something of a scramble, but also a lack of security of property rights. If you can't stake a claim like a prospector in a gold rush, then other commercial operators or state enterprises could come along and mine right beside you in an area where you've done all the preliminary work to identify viable resources for extraction. Uh, the third possibility would be to treat the seabed as raisonulius, so as belonging to no one and capable of being acquired by occupation. Uh, but one great commentator on the law of the sea, Daniel O'Connell, noted that this in practice would be rather difficult. It's rather difficult to assert the physical occupation of the seabed because it's not a particularly easy area in which to uh, build permanent habitations, government bases, or the, uh, the kinds of things we associate with sovereign occupation. So the principles established under the Law of the Sea Convention were echoing language from the UN General Assembly resolutions and Ambassador Pardo that the deep seabed should be governed as the common heritage of mankind. So Article 136 of the Convention states the area and its resources of the common heritage of mankind, the area being the area beyond national jurisdiction, beyond the limits of exclusive economic zones and continental shelves. Article 137 says that no state shall claim sovereignty over any part of the area and that the area cannot be appropriated and notes that all rights in resources in the area are vested in mankind as a whole. And we should note the contrast here with Article 2 of the High Seas Convention and its principle of freedom. Uh, under Article 140, um, activities in the area should be carried out for the benefit of mankind as a whole. And the authority, that's the International Seabed Authority set up under the Convention, shall provide for the equitable sharing of financial and other economic benefits derived from activities in the area. So here we see the beginnings of a system being laid out. The area should belong to everyone, it should be collectively managed, and uh, financial benefits derived from the area should be shared amongst all states. Uh, and finally, Article 141, the area shall be open to use exclusively for peaceful purposes by all states. And there's a question here about whether that requires the deep seabed to be demilitarised and never used for military activity. Um, but we've seen this debate play out in relation to the high seas. And if, uh, if the intention was to prevent the installation of weapons on the seabed, then language to that effect could have been used. And indeed, there is a separate treaty regarding um, banning the placement of weapon systems on the seafloor. All right. Now, if you're going to have international management of the deep seabed, you require a management authority. And as Rothwell and Stevens put it, much of the controversy at the third UN Convention on the Law of the Sea in relation to the deep seabed regime turned on what would be the nature and powers of the International Seabed Authority. Developing states wanted an, a seabed authority that would have far-reaching powers to regulate mining and engage in mining itself, whereas the industrialised countries in which the major mining companies were based sought a more skeletal institution that would operate essentially as a registry for concessions. So these are the two competing visions, essentially one where you have the International Seabed Authority operating a planned economy for the deep seabed, including an international enterprise like a state-owned corporation, but an international level conducting mining itself. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have developing states arguing for almost something like Torrance Title land registration and a completely minimal international institution. And we will pick up on that controversy in the second of these recordings. Thank you.